Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Phoenix and our Summer Changes Everything National Conference. I came down from Salem, Oregon, where on Friday we had a 15-minute hailstorm. So I'm glad to have 95 degrees today. About a year ago, I was visiting an elementary school and talking with a group of parents about our work. And right off the bat, one mother asked me, what is summer learning and why does it matter? And normally, I either talk about summer learning loss and the impact that that loss has on achievement over time, or I talk about the creativity and innovation that's happening in summer programs around the country. But this time, I said something different. I said, summer learning is about our kids' hopes and dreams. I said, if a, if a child's dream is to be the first in his family or her family to go to college, then summer learning is a part of that. And our work is making sure that it's not an optional maybe part of it, but that there's a system in place for summer learning to play a real role in helping that child achieve his or her dream. And when I said that, this mother started to laugh. And I said, what's funny about that? And she said she had an eight-year-old, a second grader, and that he had a dream. And I said, great, what, you know, what was his dream? And she said, first I want to tell you that my husband and I work very hard, and we came to this country to help our children achieve their dreams. And then she said, almost like a confession, that her son had told her that his dream was to be a caveman. <laughs> so she said, I told him, that is not a good dream. So welcome again. We have a, a, a packed uh, conference and a, and a great session this morning. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. First, the mobile app. This is one of those conferences where we encourage you to have your phone out. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the app, please do so. You can do it right now. I won't take offense. Uh, don't call your spouse, but you know, just download the phone. Um, we're going to uh, uh, use the app this year um, kind of like a focus group. We are entering a new strategic planning progress, uh, process, and our goal is to solicit from you all our programs and partners and friends in the field some strategic items. So think of, of it as a focus group with 400 of our closest friends. So we're going to actually do the uh, uh, focus group questions in this sort of general session, and we'll have the results uh, in real time up on the screen, and it's data that we'll collect and use. Uh, secondly, we always get inquiries about our work and how we can partner with communities and programs around the country. We're starting something new this year called Office Hours. It sounds like detention, but it's really a chance uh, for you to schedule some one-on-one -on -one time with our uh, staff and program and systems quality. So if you'd like to do that at the registration desk, you can set up a 30-minute session to talk with our, our team. Um, and then third, uh, the uh, hotel staff asked us uh, to remind folks to drink water at every conference. They have lots of outer towners like myself, people from Oregon, who uh, allow themselves to get dehydrated. So uh, drink some water, please. Next year, NSLA, uh, celebrates our 25th anniversary. And I would argue that as a field, we have made enormous progress in those 25 years. Awareness of the issue is certainly growing. More parents, teachers, principals, uh, philanthropists, policymakers know about the research on summer learning loss and know about the effectiveness of summer learning programs. Participation in programs is growing, the number of programs is growing. Our Summer Learning Day celebration, for example, has grown over the years to close to a million children in a thousand programs. The Excellence Award, which we'll celebrate this morning, is an example of, it, of improvements in quality um, over the years in summer learning programs. And I would argue that what 25 years ago might have been uh, understood to be sort of a smattering of loosely connected programs is now a movement, that we are a movement. We're empowered 
we're connected, and we're on a march towards making changes in communities and in town halls across the country. But of course, we have much more to do. And it's in this context that we want to ask you for some early feedback uh, on a few strategic questions. We know that we want to end summer learning loss. We know that we want to make sure that no child goes hungry during the summer months. We want summer learning to be seen as critical and not optional. We want summer to be seen as a time and space for innovation. And we want to move from pockets of excellence to systems of excellence around the country. The question, of course, is how do we do that? What is the work that we can do as NSLA and that we can do together as a field to move the ball further downfield? How do we help you grow and expand your programs? How do we help you secure long-term funding? These are questions we ask ourselves all the time. And the first question we want to ask you today. So if you've downloaded the app, take out your phone, please. Uh, our first focus group question is to ask, what is your, in your view, the most pressing challenge for us to tackle? If you got your phone out, wave it up high. It's hard for me to tell how many people. Oh, good, great. I have to, I'll give you a minute to vote. I have to confess that a week ago, I decided to download the app and I had to ask my 14 year old for help. <laughs> she kind of rolled her eyes and said, dad, this will take you, you know, a minute, just do it. And in fact, it did. So folks are still voting. I feel like it's a, it's like a, it's like watching Olympics swimming. They're like making their way in blue across. The numbers keep going up. I'll just wait a second. Thank you all for doing this. All right, so it looks like uh, nearly half of you uh, believe priority number one is to continue to focus on low-income and marginalized children. Uh, it's, it's work that I think all of us hold near and dear and will continue to do. Our second question is about the partners that we can engage. How do you prioritize um, these five potential partners? national policymakers, local policymakers, funders, community organizations, or educational institutions. These polls, by the way, we're going to uh, leave open. You can continue to vote if you didn't get a chance uh, this morning. And we will um, um, continue throughout the conference to be asking some different questions. Last time I think I saw 124, so we'll see if we can get higher than that and then I'll, we'll move on. So this is what's most interesting to us, when it is distributed roughly equally across these five potential audiences. So th this is where specifically in follow-up we need to hear, uh, we'd like to hear from you about about the, because this feels very local when it's distributed equally like that. That you have different needs in each community or state. Some states are way ad out ahead, others are, are, are still starting uh, the work on this. So um, thank you for this. We'll continue, as I said, to follow up. Um, a, a couple of, of important acknowledgements and then we'll, we'll kick it off with our Excellence Award winners. Um, our friends at the Wallace Foundation, the New York Life Foundation, and the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation have supported our work uh, for many years in a way that is long and deep and smart. And we frankly wouldn't be here without those three uh, foundations and their support. Uh, 
we have a number of communications partners. Uh, Youth Today, iHeartMedia, and Clear Channel Outdoor Advertising are helping us reach directly into uh, parents and teachers and principals. Um, thank you to those communications partners. This is a way for, for us to highlight locally, in many cases, what you all are doing. We have digital learning partners, EverFi, Home of the Summer, Slugger, Myon, and Best Buy are really expanding what summer learning means to uh, the internet and to digital learning. We have two publishing partners, Carson DeLosa and Scholastic, which are providing high quality materials to schools and uh, families. And then finally, uh, it's a real pleasure to announce a new partnership with Kids Read Now, which is a national nonprofit that provides books to kindergarten through third grade students over the summer. They particularly uh, uh, work well with students in rural areas because they mail the books to them. So for uh, those folks where, or places where transportation is a challenge, Kids Read Now is reaching directly into the homes. It's important to note that Kids Read Now has offered all of you a discount on their services. They have a booth, as all of our exhibitors and sponsors do, a booth right outside downstairs. Uh, so um, run out there and say, show me the money, I want that discount, Kids Read Now. And then finally, um, I want to thank all of you for the work you do. We had a meeting yesterday with the editorial board at the Arizona Republic, just down the street. Uh, you know, and, and at the end of the meeting, this editorial board, uh, this editor said to us, y'all are doing God's work. And I wanted to pass that on. You know, he said, the work you do is important, but there's never enough money, right? There's always policymakers or policy challenges. Uh, there's, there's never enough capacity, and yet the work we do matters. We know it helps kids. It's important, uh, and, and we all should uh, feel good about it. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll see that in the editorial pages of the Arizona Republic, but if they don't publish something, he said it, and I wanted to, to pass it on all, to all of you. And so now we're going to welcome our New York Life Foundation Excellence Award winners. It's a long-standing partnership with New York Life. It's a real pleasure to honor our colleague at New York Life and our friend, a summer learning champion, Marlene Torres, who is the Corporate Vice President for Corporate Responsibility and a Senior Program Officer at New York Life, and with her, our own Monica Logan, Vice President at NSLA. Please join me in welcoming them. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Thank you, Matthew. I'm honored to be here today at the NSLA National Conference to help congratulate the four winners of the New York Life Foundation Excellence in Summer Learning Awards. Part of the reason that I enjoy attending this event year after year is because I get to see our mission come to life. If you're not familiar, part of New York Life's mission is to help families build brighter futures with solid financial building blocks. Funding initiatives that offer enrichment for middle school youth, often a particularly critical time in a child's life, is a direct nat natural extension of that. As you may already know, studies show that habits formed in middle school persist through adulthood, adulthood and that students who begin high school well prepared are four times more likely to graduate and go on to college. The foundation supports organizations that offer programs to help build stronger academic and social foundations for middle school students, particularly during the critical after school hours and summer months. To date, the foundation has given over 23 million in grants to this specific uh, focus area. In 2010, the foundation awarded a grant to NSLA to recognize programs that keep students learning, safe, 
and healthy during the critical summer months. Since then, we've provided over 1.6 million in support to NSLA. Every year since then, it has given me great joy to see the results of our investment in summer learning. It is important to highlight exemplary programs and showcase how, they're de how they are demonstrating excellence in accelerating academic achievement and promoting healthy development in children and youth. We are proud to have our name attached to an award that recognizes the importance of summer learning. Without further ado, now we'll get to the fun part, uh, to celebrate the winners that have set the standard for quality summer programming. These organizations are helping thousands of children across the country keep pace with their peers academically and socially, and I'm proud to have the opportunity to congratulate them in person. But first, here's Monica. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, good morning. Good morning. All right. This is always my favorite part of the conference, um, along with the uh, happy hour yesterday. But anyway, um, so um, we're really excited and very proud this year of our Excellence Award winners. They really exemplify excellence, innovation, and results. And I had the privilege, it's always really interesting, as you all know, you spend all these months running around planning for those four to six weeks and they're gone. And so that's when our staff is out in the field and seeing excellence in action. And so I had the, very, the, the great privilege of seeing these programs in action, several of them, to include getting in a canoe, fishing, putting one of those squirmy uh, fi um, worms on the hook, which I will never do again. But, but they had kids in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, doing it joyfully and happily. And so uh, we were, I was blown away by seeing NSLA's vision in action through these, these four amazing programs. So we wanted to show you how the power of summer, summer is Real through a very short video that we have that shows these winners in action. And also to see, to hear what they do, we suggest that you all see, go to their How Did They Do It workshops that will be immediately after this session and then again after 12 o'clock. Here's our video. Fishing, they taught us how to cast out and how to double hook the worm on the, the hook. It was super fun. I actually touched a worm for the first time. It was really cool. I know that's not like really big to a lot of people, but to me it is because I'm really scared of bugs. And I found a caterpillar. That was really fun. We do super fun things with our kids and we are making sure that they're camp things so that they're not in school, but the kids are actually learning and they're, and they're growing an appreciation for learning and a passion for learning. I knew that if I could do good just for, these sim just for these young children, then maybe I could do good for the rest of the, my community. So afterwards I caught on being good, having hope, and believing that I can make a difference. I decided I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to make a difference. I first went to camp thinking I was just a counselor for one cabin. And when I was leaving, I ended up being a counselor of over eight cabins, knowing that they all looked up to me as a hero. And that's what made me proud.
So we're also very excited because the actual awards this year that, that the, that the uh, winners will receive were created in partnership with students at the Best Buy Teen Tech Center at Gold Crown in Lakewood, Colorado. So they're really gorgeous and we ha even had young people design and make the awards. Marlon? At your tables, you've received an Excellence Award Bulletin, so you can read all about these, more about these wonderful programs and also attend one of their workshops following this session. So let's welcome to the stage this year's Excellence in Summer Learning Award winner, Camp Goods Sam from San Antonio, Texas. Accepting the award on their behalf are Jennifer Cook, Director of Program Operations at Good Samaritan, Community Services, and its CEO, Simone Salas. says chivalry is dead. Um, thank you. Let's see. So from San Antonio, now that all my notes are out of order, give me a second. This is where we play the Jeopardy music. So let's see here. Wonderful. So this is how we pivot and kids need to learn that too, how to pivot, how to. So let's see here. Okay, this year we have three NSLA find Founders Awards which celebrate non-traditional and formal summer programs or wraparound models that support summer programs. Let's welcome to the stage Canoe Mobile of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Accepting this award is Julie Stork, Associate Director of Wilderness Inquiry. Okay, next up we have Save the Children's Summer Boost Camp, which is, is, which is a national model, and the NSLA team visited the site in Yucca Valley, California. Accepting this award is uh, Kara Schreck, Director of School Age Programs, and Diana Leske, Program Coordinator. Last but not least, our final award winner is Summer Collab, hailing from Wilmington, Delaware. Let's welcome Catherine Lendroth, founder and executive director. Thank you all, and let's give all our winners another great round of applause.
Thank you, Marlene, and thank you, New York Life. Our 2018 Excellence Award applications will be open by the end of this week on Friday. Check out our website if you'd like to apply. One of the benefits uh, of applying is that we strive to give feedback to every applicant. And so win or lose in terms of, of the award, hopefully it's a professional development uh, opportunity for all the programs. So let me uh, welcome up our panelists. Uh, please all come up and, and take your seats. I'm gonna introduce our moderator and she in turn will uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, Margaret McKenna is a special woman, uh, a longtime champion of summer learning. Uh, the first time we met, she beat me up for about three hours <laughs> and then she gave us a grant. She uh, is smart and she digs in because she cares about this issue. Margaret was longtime president of Leslie University and then the first president of the Walmart Foundation. And in that capacity as the first president, she was able to shape their agenda and she made it a priority to support summer learning. Um, she is now uh, thankfully our board chair a great friend of ours and a great friend of this issue. So please join me in welcoming Margaret. Thank you, Matthew. So thank you, Matthew. And let me add my uh, welcome. It's great to see so many old friends and new friends uh, here to Phoenix and to our conference. So as Matthew said, uh, I was the president of the Walmart Foundation having spent my whole life begging for money uh, as a university president, as people say, we live in big houses and beg. That's what university presidents do. And then I was running the largest corporate foundation in the world. And in fact, the last year I was there, I gave away $1 billion. That's with a B. So uh, I, I, I went to the foundation and I thought, well, the one thing I know about is education, right? So that, 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 that sector, I will know how to give money away in that sector. Sustainability, not so much. You know, I, I cared about the environment, but I know a lot about sustainability. Jobs, you know, workforce jobs a little bit. You know, some of the other things I really didn't know much about, but education, but I could give money away in education. I knew about that because Leslie University concentrated in teacher ed, so I knew K through 12, I knew higher ed. And let me tell you, it was the hardest thing because I knew too much. Right? I knew what did not work. And I knew a lot of money had been wasted in philanthropy and education on shiny, bright objects, right? new things. So it took me longer to figure out what to do in education than in anything else. And I read a lot of Carl Alexander. Where's Carl Alexander? So the father of uh, research in uh, summer learning. And, I, and we spent a lot of time looking at what to give money for. And we gave more money to summer learning than anything else. Because the return on the investment was higher than anything else. And our other concentration was on hunger, so we combined the two. So food, uh, and Walmart still uh, is the largest funder of uh, summer food. Uh, and, uh, and I will say uh, uh, I'm proud of, of, uh, of uh, of that investment, and when I left Walmart, the only nonprofit board I joined was NSLA, and uh, it's an incredible investment. And in NSLA, is in, in summer learning and after school, have made a, a, a huge, I think, uh, progress, thanks to uh, what Carl has done and thanks to what Wallace has done in terms of knowledge and practice, uh, incredible uh, uh, advancement. But I think we're at a pivotal point now uh, in terms of, uh, I asked Gigi from Wallace and she'll talk about it, are people pushing back on the evidence now? Not so much. I think people aren't saying it doesn't work. I think people now are saying, okay, we, we agree it works. Stop, stop already. We believe you, we believe you. But you know, federal funding is in question. We don't have a lot of friends in Washington. Uh, to Not too much are people saying, here's more money for education, not so much. Uh, you know, we're moving to the states and to the cities for support, uh, but it's hard to do this one by one. Uh, so we need a social movement. We need some support. And we need more awareness of this issue. And we, you know, social movements take everybody. 
So we need a wide range of partners to move this forward. So I can't think of a better group of people uh, to join us today to talk about what's next. Where do we go next? And how can we help all of you move this agenda forward? So let me uh, introduce our panelists, all right? So you have met Marlon, uh, and she has talked about New York Life, and we're so grateful to her for uh, the excellence awards and her support. And one of the reasons is because it, it uh, highlights best practice. And we wanna keep getting better at what we do, and one of the ways to do that is to show you the people who are succeeding, and you had an example of them today. So Jeannie Antoni is the Director of Learning and Enrichment at the Wallace Foundation, and they are our heroes in terms of, you know, for 50 years, in terms of education. I feel like I've sort of known them for 50 years too, practically, <laughs> almost, right? Um, they've done so much to support uh, education and uh, they've been just terrific in terms of uh, research and knowledge and evidence and awareness in this whole field of summer and after school and really help improve the practice. Um, and, and Gigi was in the field for many years in Dallas. She comes with, uh, you know, solid practical experience. Uh, and uh, we're thrilled to see you at Wallace. Uh, uh, so Carrie uh, from uh, the, uh, Carrie Party from the Charles Mott Foundation I always, I always look at the Mott Foundation, Charles Mott Foundation is one of the innovative foundations. Some foundations are a little more uh, cautious than others and some are innovators and Mott has always been one of them. Uh, and it's interesting, it's been a foundation which has been innovative and interested in scale both, which is a sort of a hard combination to have. I love their, their uh, sort of when they explain who they are, promoting a just, equitable and sustainable society. We're in favor of that. Um, yes, amen. Yeah. Amen, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and particularly emphasizing support of disadvantaged youth. So uh, Carrie is a program officer there, particularly interested in, in education, and we welcome her today. Dan Levy comes from a different world. Dan is a board member in NSLA, he joined us this year. We're thrilled to have him. Uh, he is a VP and chief marketing officer at Clear Channel Outdoor America, uh, and I had no idea what that is <laughs> when I met him. Um, and it was interesting, to, uh, yesterday when I came in from the airport, I saw all these digital signs and other things about, uh, about trafficking. And, you know, if you see something that looks like trafficking, report it too. And that's the kind of thing that Dan's organization does, is, is public awareness in the nonprofit world, partnering with folks uh, in the nonprofit world. But uh, Clear Channel is one of the world's largest outdoor advertising companies in the world. It, it reaches a half billion people in 40 countries. Uh, it, you would see them at train stations and airports. Uh, and what you might have seen is they joined with NSLA on smarter summers for PSA announcements, uh, and we were thrilled to have them as partners this summer. So we welcome Dan, so we welcome all of our panel today, and as you can see, the richness of their experience and their commitment. So I'm gonna start by asking, why summer? You guys have lots of options to spend your time, money, resources, energy, maybe an hour or two of your time off a week. Why summer? Dan, why don't we start with you? Um, thanks, Margaret, um, and I appreciate the, the introduction. Uh, this is new to me. I'm, I've been 30 years in the advertising and media industry, <clears throat> and when I got the opportunity to get more involved with an SLA, I, I jumped at it for a couple of reasons. Um, why summer? From a uh, professional standpoint, Clear Channel's business is somewhat unique. Uh, most advertising media is sort of ephemeral. It's over the airwaves or on 
the internet or on your phone. We are literally physically a part of the community. We don't exist as a business without the permission and the support of these local communities where we build these signs that help promote our clients, but also the causes we get behind. And so being a part of that community and supporting the causes that matter in our communities is critical to our existence as a business. And there's no issue that's more important to our team members, to our customers, to the elected officials that we work with than education. Um, and so we re get really involved and we take it seriously and we can talk about what we do on a national level, more importantly on an activation level locally in partnering. Um, on a personal level, my son is 19 years old. He's a sophomore at the University of California at Irvine and he was K through 12 in public schools in New York City, um, which is a really, really hard thing to do. The opportunities are fantastic there, but what I recognized and my wife and I talked about through those 13 years is how fortunate we were that we had uh, the, the financial ability uh, to be able to participate in the process, that the, both of us were there and active and able to support him, uh, and we could take a part in his education. And we looked around and there's so many people in New York City um, single parents, multiple kids, working in hourly uh, wage jobs where they don't have the ability to step aside from that to go and meet the principal of the school that you're potentially looking to get your kid into or to spend time uh, doing open houses and going to meet with the, the, the teachers. We were very fortunate that we were able to guide our son through that process. There's so many people that uh, didn't have that ability, so on a personal level, it just, it's something that when, you know, I got the call when I first met Margaret and I first met Matthew, it just seemed like a, a ideal opportunity for me to personally get involved and give back and support people who didn't have the opportunity that we had. Great. Well, we're glad you did. I'm glad I'm doing this well. Carrie. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> they are awake. They are awake. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Mott Foundation has been in existence since the 1920s and have really been actually supporting after school and summer learning in all different capacities for more than 80 years. Uh, it started with our involvement with community schools, which began in Flint, Michigan, where we are at, and then has carried on all the way through our, our partnership with the Department of Education 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Um, as a result of that partnership, there are 1.6 million kids in after school and summer learning programs at over 11,000 sites each year. And while we think that's great, we also know there's more to be done. And so the Mott Foundation then decided as a way to help continue to move the needle was to establish statewide after school networks. And I am happy to say that we are in all 50 states now. Um, and so that's something that we've been really pushing on for the last several years to ensure that there is a voice at the state level really working on supporting after school and summer learning and that can provide a lot of those quality supports, wraparound uh, information, research, innovation, policy um, that each state then can go to for that information. And um, in addition then, we also fund a lot of national organizations such as the After School Alliance that has been a true champion, uh, especially over this last uh, year with everything that's been going on in DC as well as our National Summer Learning Association. So we really look at who are those national players that we should be supporting to support this movement. Um, and while we think that that is great, again, and that we're, we're doing what we can, we also know that there are still a lot of work to be done. And I say we, because it's all of us that it's gonna take to do this work. Uh, currently, and these are some stats that people probably know, but there are 10.2 million children in after school and summer learning programs. And that's a huge number, right? That's something to celebrate. But the fact is, is that there are 19.4 million, I just wanna say it again, 19.4 million children that would be in a program if one were available. We have a lot of work to do, we do. So that is why we support after school and summer learning because we want to make sure that we're moving that needle and to provide opportunities for all kids. So we know why you're, uh, <laughs> well, you're interested. You spent your life in the field uh, <laughs> working in summer learning. Uh, yes, so um, I'm really indeed. glad to be here. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to have been asked to speak to you. There's so many friends and colleagues um, in, the, in the audience and it's, it's wonderful to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. So I am new to the position at Wallace. I've only been there about four months, um, but I do have a long history, of, a long professional and personal history in 
in the field. And you know, the question, why summer? Um, it, there's, uh, I, I want to answer that from, from a Wallace perspective first, and then I'll share a little bit about how I came to summer. So, you know, the Wallace Foundation is, a, is an unusual foundation, I think, in that it always has a dual goal when it funds. One is to add value to the cities and communities um, that it's supporting around the issues in education that, um, that it's committed to. Um, but it also has a goal to create um, knowledge for the field to use, to be able to um, inform practice, to um, create um, strong strategies that help us as practitioners improve our work, scale our work, sustain our work for American children beyond the, uh, the cities that are being funded directly or the organizations that are be funding, being funded directly. And uh, the Wallace Foundation, as you know, has made a tremendous investment over the last really about a decade in um, summer learning and, and um, after school and has partnered with these amazing foundations to the <laughs> left and right of me and helping to uh, create um, conditions where we can learn about uh, what really makes a difference for children. And so, um, you know, the reason summer was chosen, now that I've been, I was, I was a fundee of the Wallace Foundation, Big Thought was the organization that I came from, um, for many years, and now that I've had a chance to see um, how the foundation makes a choice about what it decides to invest in, it's very clear that summer um, is a, a space um, where uh, a real return on investment, as Margaret was saying, a place where new knowledge could make a really big difference. And um, so my colleague Ann Stone, who's here in the in the audience led a tremendous initiative and we are um, you know, sharing that knowledge with the field as we go forward. For me, um, personally, um, summer was always an opportunity for innovation. Um, it was an opportunity to bring partners together in new ways. It was an opportunity to help our mayor, our libraries, our rec centers, our school districts, um, to come together in new ways in powerful partnership that often um, really ranged, began in the summer, but began to impact work in out of school time all year round. It was a time of great generative time of new work and innovation um, and, and for practitioners to be able to innovate. Um, that's why summer, because the need is so big and because the kids that it affects um, in, in our communities are those that, if you don't have the discretionary time and income, are affected uh, two times um, as much as middle and upper income American children. And so it's a huge need, it's a big lever, um, and it's worth um, the investment. Ma, thank you. Uh, Ma, what about New York Life? How did they come to summer? So for New York Life, uh, I've been with the foundation for 10 years, and we have two focus areas. One is uh, supporting organizations that help provide bereavement support for children that have lost a parent, caregiver, a sibling. And that's uh, directly aligned with the business of the company. We're primarily a life insurance company in addition to the other financial products that the company um, uh, manages and, and, and sells to its policyholders. Education was its second focus area. And before we were broader, we would support a number of issues within education. And then we came to a point where we're not the Walmart Foundation, so we don't have quite a billion dollars laying around. Uh, so we decided how could we as a foundation really have an impact and make a difference? So we had to narrow our focus. At the time, we had been headed in this direction in terms of we were funding more middle school programs and funding more out of school time programs. Uh, internally, the, the way the process worked for us is um, I developed a position paper where we looked at all of the research that was out there that was really pointing to the missing middle, middle school youth and such a critical time that is where you could really change the trajectory of a young person's life. And we saw what was, you know, all the adolescent brain development research, all the research around social emotional learning skills, and, you know, middle school youth, middle school youth. Um, 
it kept coming uh, as a priority in, in all that we found. And we found that other areas were, there's, there's a lot of demand and not enough funding, that's understood, but we really saw um, there was a, more of a gap, a funding gap in that middle school space, particularly out of school time programs. So we decided about four years or so to focus on that transition from eighth to ninth grade and really supporting out of school time organizations. So after school, summer, extended day that really provide those wraparound and additional supports to the traditional school day. And that's how we came to that, um, that decision of, okay, we need to focus and target this to try and really make a difference. And when we did that, obviously we looked at all the providers and our partners in the field um, to, to really form that true partnership. We developed a peer learning group uh, that took place over two years and we wanted to hear from our main grantees about um, 19 or so grantees came together over a two year period to really help inform us what are the priorities, what are you seeing in the field, so we can be responsive to that. And that's how we came to that decision and that's how we try to work with our grantees in partnership around the middle school, out of school time space. Great, and so many of you have mentioned the word partnership. And uh, there are a lot of different folks here. I know there are a lot of libraries represented. I, I love libraries and <laughs> yay. <laughs> and, and you guys have really stepped up in the, you know, in the last decade or two to do a lot of things that, that you know, decades ago weren't done in libraries and stepped in to fill a lot of holes, that's for sure, that have been left, uh, left by others. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about partnership, what you've seen, any of you that have worked and not worked, uh, and um, an advice you would give to people. You know, I, I'm like big on partnerships because I, I have to tell you one thing is, the other thing we did at Walmart was hunger relief. And I'm convinced, unlike uh, after school and summer where you need money, I'm sure that if any state in our uh, country practically could be hunger free, because there's enough food if everybody would work together. I mean, there's literally enough food in this country to feed everybody. And I, I actually will tell you, I went to, I'll give you an unnamed state, I won't name them, and I said, we will fund you if you will work together, all of you, and create a hunger-free state. And they said, eh. <laughs> wow. So, uh, you know, this is, takes some money, but partnerships are tough. Yeah. They're tough. So can any of you all, you know, how have they worked? What are the lessons learned? I mean, uh, unlike hunger, which I think you just need food and a little help to get started, this takes money and effort. So what, what are the lessons learned and what would you tell people that they should look toward and work on? All of you have had this experience, so anybody uh, jump in. I can start, that's fine. Um, so I think there's a couple of things, um, and I do want to give an example as well, but I think the great space, and it's been said, Gigi said it, is that after school and summer learning creates this place for innovation, and it creates a time where we can test things out, see if it works, see if the kids like it, are they interested, are they engaged, and then if it works, figure out how to scale it and share it, and I think that is the great thing about this field, is that actually the the programs are really good about sharing information and sharing resources and ideas. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. I mean, you know, if there's a great program, let's talk about it, let's share it at these conferences and push it out. Um, so I think that that's one of the pieces and I, um, one of the programs I do wanna share is actually with the libraries um, that our uh, Oregon Statewide After School Network, Oregon AST, helped to pilot in partnership with National Summer Learning Association. And I just think it was really great. It's, um, and touches on your, your uh, focus as well. So it's called Summer Learning, Summer Library, and Summer Lunch. And so this program started in 2012 at four pilot sites. And it was really just a time to actually open up the elementary and middle school libraries that were closed in the summer and give kids a chance to come in, read, continue their academics, 
and also take on enrichment activities and of course get food, so have to have lunch. As a result of this partnership, partnering with the Department of Education in Oregon and others, they have now scaled this project to over 30 sites in just a couple of years and are impacting about 7,500 kids. That is something that I've seen this program where our other statewide after school networks are saying, well, we could use libraries, right? We have the libraries here. Why don't we model this program and share it? So I think that that's something that the field needs to continue to do. But I think that part of that challenge is, and you've talked about this, is we have to all let our guard down. And, I, and by we, it's not necessarily the programs, but it's the partners in the community and the funders and the other players. Um, if the partners will put their guard down and say, you know, it's not about just my interest, but how do we work together to then do this, we can move the needle a lot farther. So Maybe. I think that, I think that um, this idea of, I, I love this, you know, I don't know that if we all just work together, there would be enough summer learning for every oh, kid right. that needs it. So I'm not sure that that's quite the right. same right. situation. but. But I do know that there is a tremendous amount of summer learning that goes on that is unconnected or inaccessible. And one of the things that the Summer Learning Project at Wallace, I think, uh, really brought home um, and, and, and the learning that was generated out of that and published out of that work um, for our community um, in Dallas was that quality mattered and dosage mattered and um, attendance mattered. And uh, that to really move the needle for kids, that it wasn't enough for us to partner, that we had to a partner around principles or around um, outcomes for kids that we could all agree on, whether we were the library or the mayor's youth development office or the school district or um, individual providers. And, and in a way, the way that, that I see, and again, I'm just speaking as a practitioner now, um, you know, the way I see the field is that it is evolving um, from uh, what was uh, either punitive or custodial care in the summer, um, a remediation to really rich learning, connected learning um, in communities. And I think um, when we think about partnering, it's really building a big enough tent that we're able to um, implement as a community high quality um, uh, summer learning. Um, and, and the Wallace Foundation publications, are, you know, really focus. I think that's one of the biggest um, uh, benefits of the work that, that, that the foundation has done has been really to lay out what matters in terms of what you have to think about to get quality um, um, in a, a summer program. And they're not the only ones, obviously. There are other places to look for that information, but particularly in partnership with school districts. And so I think one of the most important partners in a community for us to uh, really try to engage is our school districts. Yeah. Um, our school districts and to help them understand their role um, in working with the community to provide high quality summer learning. Um, but starting early, um, thinking about making sure that kids are getting enough um, learning to really move the needle and then in the uh, connection between enrichment and um, academic support, making sure that in food and you know all of those great things. But partnership isn't enough and how big the partnership isn't enough. It's really about um, applying our knowledge in the field and making sure that we're providing programs that really can make a difference for kids. Dan? Just building on that, you know, I, I'm, so I'm the for-profit guy in the room. I'm probably the only one. Um, this is relatively new for us, but I mean, we're a for-profit business that takes seriously the idea of corporate social responsibility, and like I said before, our role in the community. But here's the thing. Nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to do partnerships, right? And when you get not-for-profit, for-profit, elected officials, the media around a table together, the big risk is that everyone talks and nothing happens. And so what we tend to do is we want to be really brutally honest with who we are and what we bring to the party and then try and lead towards a common goal. So when we talk about partners, anyone who has a program in a local community can certainly call up Clear Channel's local offices. We have 30 offices around the country. You can certainly call us up and say, we'd love for you to run some free ads promoting what we do. And it may or may not happen. 
the way that it really happens is when we get together, sit around the table and talk about our common interests and finding that overlap and then being brutally honest amongst the group about who does what and what do you bring to the party. And so we literally, within our business, uh, we create playbooks. Uh, each of our local markets has a market president who runs that business locally and they're commercial leaders. They don't really do this. And so there's a member of my team who frankly should be up here and should get all the credit for everything that we've done with NSLA, a guy named Jason King. He runs all of our corporate so social responsibility programs. What Jason does is creates playbooks and provides them to all of our markets and shares with them best practices on this is how you partner and this is how you work with the causes that we support nationally like NSLA, but also how do you find those programs locally that support that, uh, the, the mission? And how do you find the right ones that we can help? Because what we do, to be clear, we're in the communications business. We are in the business of letting a lot of people know about things as they're happening. And so that's what we bring to the party. But what we can also do is bring the media. So Matthew talked about a meeting yesterday with the local newspaper. When we do activations with NSLA and with local programs, we make sure that the media is there. We want to make sure that we're not just creating an event and no one hears about it. We want to make sure that in the news they're talking about it and we get the reporters there so it's on the evening news and we get the newspapers so that they're writing about it. Social media is a huge part of what we do. That's what we can do is kind of step yeah. on the gas and accelerate that process. We're not the people who can tell a, a nonprofit program how to run that uh, side of things. What we want to do is amplify that. Yeah. And I think what, what we try to do is make sure when we get the partners around the table that based on our experience, we can maybe guide them when it's needed. And in other situations, we step back and say, you guys tell us what you're gonna do and we'll make sure that people know about it. So I think it's about being honest with each other. You know, Dee Dee, just to follow up on what you said a minute is, uh, I know my friend Chris Smith is probably here somewhere from Boston. Uh, and uh, you know, the tough love uh, he ha did in Boston, uh, I, in my 100 year history, I was on the Boston School Committee for a little bit and what they did is exactly what you said is they went for quality and they did an evaluation rubric. And if your organization in after school and summer didn't want to get evaluated with the rubric, you know, you didn't get any support and that support then went to the high quality programs. So that's tough love, but you know, that money needs to go to quality, yeah. not in, in Boston, everybody has their own nonprofit, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and so, you know, some of those nonprofits went away, which they should, and you need to concentrate on what works yeah. in these high quality. So, you know, unlike hunger, then there's only a, a limited amount of resources and they need to go with what works. Yeah. Uh, what about innovation, uh, Marlon? You've done some looking at partnerships and innovation. What have, what have you seen out there? Our approach to partnerships is to be, to approach it honestly in terms of communication. If we're implementing or supporting a pilot, we need to be flexible in terms of if something doesn't work, if a change needs to be made. It sounds fairly simple or intuitive, but I think in terms of the power dynamic between a funder and a grantee, I think sometimes our grantee partners um, feel that they, everything has to be right all the time or they won't continue funding us. And our approach is that we want an honest, conversation and relationship and communication is important, trust and communication is important, that if something doesn't work at a school or another site, uh, it's important to know and to recognize that and move forward. So in terms of partnership, we're investing in our grantees because we believe in the program and the people and the potential of that partnership. So that's one approach uh, that we take. And in terms of, of partnerships in the community, I, just echoing what some of my panel members have said, it's so important to really leverage all the community assets that exist in, in neighborhoods, such as libraries and schools. And for us particularly, also recognizing what, each, what strength each partner brings. So sitting, 
at a corporate foundation, we have access to a couple of things that our nonprofit partners may not have access to. So we have access to some elected officials. So we try and say, well, in your district, we're funding X number of after school programs in these communities to help keep the, the importance of after school and summer present. So that's one strength that we bring, that we try to bring to the partnership. So we try to do that. Um, we also have access to um, our volunteers in certain communities, they're very active. So we look at each partner strength and really try to leverage and, and build upon that. And I, I think what's um, also important is um, equality is very important. Um, and in terms of meeting children and families where they are. Um, one personal and one personal story I'll share is, uh, so I grew up in New York City. Nobody, really, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, so I grew up in New York City. Um, I grew up in a, you know, as they say in the hood, um, in, a, in a poor neighborhood and there was no summer learning. Uh, I was fortunate that my family did save up everything and I would get to spend summers in Puerto Rico. Yes. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I was able, so, uh, and, and that was eye-opening because it, that was my summer learning and I appreciate the time I had <coughs> with my family and being in a different environment. <laughs> that was my wilderness inquiry based learning when I went there from, you know, Bushwick, Brooklyn to San Sebastián, Puerto Rico. It was quite a, a change there in scenery. But the one place that my mother felt safe, um, she did allow me to go to the library. Mm. So that was uh, my escape and of course I loved the library. So looking at where can you have that parent engagement, where do you have access to the young people that could benefit from your programs, is allowing for that array of programming. Um, obviously, it, quality always needs to be front and center, but providing that opportunity of meeting families where they are and meeting children where they are, and to begin to have that parent engagement, that youth voice. So that's also part of um, certain partnerships. So I expanded upon your, your, your question and answering yeah. that. But I think it's important because as I reflect on it and I think of my own uh, personal development, um, you know, being one of those, those statistics of, you know, low-income children and all that, um, I, I was in a, a loving family, but, and, you know, uh, there, there, there weren't any resources. But it's not that working parents don't want that, right. but Absolutely. that's what you're working for, right? right, right. So it's right. recognizing that and really being tuned into that and then really trying to leverage those partnerships. And that's why partnerships are so important. And that's, that's why I still love the library. <laughs> and it's such a great asset to have. And one last thing story I'll share, I think some of, I may have shared this with somebody, but my daughter who's seven, last year she says, when she was going to her summer camp, which was an arts camp, because she's fabulous. Um, <laughs> says, That's really shocking. <laughs> so okay. she says, she says, uh, mommy, are you going to work? I said, yes, honey, I'm going to work. She's like, you work in the summer? <laughs> and I say that because learning should be fun and engaging and it should be about enrichment and not just remediation. So to echo your point, Gigi. You know what you said about uh, uh, low income parents really care. Uh, you know, there was a study done uh, maybe a year, 18 months ago. That I sit on the math board of Ed now and it, it, somebody did a report and it was about that. It was about uh, middle income parents and low income parents. And literally the report said, low income parents care at least as much as middle income parents about their children succeeding. And there were people here there who were really surprised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, like that was news to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's this sense that 
you know, well, they don't, they don't care. Right. They care at least as much. They don't have the resources or the time, but right. they care at least as much. And so, you know, the, the sort of prejudice of not having the time, Dan, what you talked about, people not having the time and the resources, doesn't mean they don't care. I mean, they don't have the resources. So important to know. So one thing I would just love to add about resources, and, and I used to spend my summers in La Hermana. You and I need, do need to go have lunch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, it is, is that one of the things about partnerships, too, is that they are so powerful because they bring together um, and you've heard this from mo uh, almost everyone on the panel, um, they bring together people with not like skills. Right. So, you know, the, the mom in the neighborhood or the, the, the institutions in a neighborhood that can bring value to yeah. a kid's life in the summer, like the library in your example, but many, whether they're faith-based or they're schools or they're the rec center personnel, it's those adults that are embedded in neighborhoods and in the summer, from the mayor's office to the school district to the city infrastructure to the neighborhood infrastructure, through partnerships, we can link those in ways that can provide quality experiences for mm -hmm. kids um, because we're not all trying to do everything. We're, we're, we're building as systems um, at our strengths. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, having a, a, the blueprint of what quality looks like and what strategies work, and then working across partnerships, I think is a very powerful strategy yeah, for yeah. providing access. And um, it extends to the school day, right? Because ultimately yeah. you want those yeah. year-round partnerships yeah. to uh, be strong. So, so Gigi, you, you mentioned a model, which was a city model, mayor, mm -hmm. real people from the neighborhood, sure. policymakers, uh, you know, uh, community, uh, leadership uh, directors of nonprofits. Uh, Carrie, you, you work in these statewide organizations. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because there's a lot going on in the states and the districts. Uh, and a lot of these folks, I think, are involved or will be involved. What, what are, what's going on out there and what should we know about? 21st century funding. 21st century funding, yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lamar Alexander says he's, it's not going to go away. He says, uh, we'll see. We're uh, hoping, and we're, we're working on that. So the statewide after school networks are really focused on policy um, by engaging key champions. So that's really, you know, you guys started talking about that, is that it is the parents, it's the community members, but it's Everyone, so grassroots to grass tops. Yeah. And we have to have everyone engaged to understand the impact of after school and summer learning. So that way that we can then build these champions that can go out and tell our story. We can tell the story, yeah. but people aren't gonna listen as much. Right. But if you hear it from a parent and the difference that it makes that they see as a result of my kid participating in this program, I can go to work. But I'm also seeing that my child is developing these three skills or found their passion for what they want to do. Those are the people to tell the story. And I also would say that we have to engage the kids themselves. Who better to tell the story and the impact of what you guys are doing every day than the students themselves? And right, a lot of times we forget about that. But you know, we've, uh, through the work of the After School Alliance, they've had some students up there recently on the Hill talking about, as a result of my program, I have a job. I'm going to school, I've got this skill, I'm going to do this. That means more sure. to those yep. key champions that we need to cultivate than anything that we can say or the research sometimes even that we can provide. Even though we know we need it and it works for some, others we need to pull at their heartstrings. And so the statewide after school networks are really trying to do that at the state level and work with you as local programs and the city infrastructure that has been built. We all have to, again, do it together for this fight and to try to gain more champions and get more funding. Dan, you look like you, I just, I, I'm sitting here being, you know, the for-profit guy on this end, listening to all this conversation and realizing how much we have in common. Um, there, there, there's so much research that talks to the importance and the efficacy of summer learning. And none of that matters if you really think about it. What convinces people is storytelling. 
and that's true in the for-profit side as well as in the non-for-profit side. We, we were speaking uh, over breakfast this morning about, I, I, I see a real empathy gap um, uh, amongst a lot of Americans, but especially amongst a lot of our uh, elected officials who look at things objectively, and if they can't relate to it, well, I can't deal with that, or it's not important to those other priorities. It's when you make it meaningful to them and tell a story. It's finding the, the truth from the research, but telling that and presenting that in a way that people can relate to and understand, whether that's on a personal level, because they think about their experience growing up or with their children, or if you just take cold objective facts and turn it into something that really uh, humanizes it. I, I think that's the challenge, frankly, and it's the hardest thing, whether we're talking about the not-for-profit world, the for-profit world, funding, whatever it may be, it's very easy to point to data. What you have to do is bring that to life, and I encourage everyone thinking about your own programs, what you're trying to achieve through those programs. Don't talk about it in terms of clinical research. Don't talk about it in terms of facts and figures. Talk about it in ways that people can really connect to. And, and again, thinking about partnership, that is one of the things that this side of the panel can do is help with that. When the, the programs that we've run in support of NSLA nationally and some of the programs that we've supported in so many of our markets, we actually not only bring the billboards, we bring a creative team and we help create the messaging because we also recognize just like people don't come out of the womb knowing how to partner, they don't know how to uh, come, come out of the womb, they don't know how to create billboard ads. Like that's part of what we can bring to it. How do you tell that story? Which typically I'm assuming many of you tell that story one-on-one -on -one or in group meetings where you have a forum to explain it. That's very different than on something that you glance at for five seconds as you're driving down the road. That's part of what we can help bring that to life in a way that still is what we're trying to do, which is ultimately drive change uh, in society. 